Good morning, this is Dr. Mike, and I want to take just a few moments to talk to you today about the section of the American history that we are covering this week, quite an interesting part of our history from 1809 to about 1832. Uh, that ending point in 1832 basically was the end of the Jackson era or the Jackson presidency, the era would probably continue. But uh, I want to just take a moment to kind of give you some perspective that I think would be helpful. Uh, in the 1809 period, we're still very much in the time of uh, trying to define America or to uh, have some kind of American identity. The Revolutionary War ended, of course, in 1781, and then we had uh, the Constitution by 1789. So we're barely a decade beyond the Constitution, and still we're not really clear as to what defines us as a people. Uh, we still have uh, are being kind of tormented or bullied by the British Empire. They're stopping our ships in at sea, and if someone had a British accent, of course, they would uh, impress them into their navy and take them off to God knows where. Uh, that became quite aggravating. The British were still present in the Ohio Valley uh, somewhat and incited Native Americans to attack the American colonies at will. And so we had several issues with the British that are going to ultimately lead us into the War of 1812. I have said other places, I don't know if I've said it to you directly, but the War of 1812 is an interesting war. It was the war that nobody wants to remember. First of all, Americans don't particularly care for the War of 1812 because we lost every land battle in the war except for one, and that was the Battle of New Orleans fought by Andrew Jackson and 800 of his Kentucky riflemen. Uh, we're not really sure about one detail of that war. The Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war, had already been signed uh, when the war happened, and we're not really sure that Andrew Jackson, whether he did or did not know that. Uh, knowing Jackson, <clears throat> he probably would have uh, pressed ahead, fought the British anyway, but he did defeat them. One of the interesting things about that is he's using 800 Kentucky riflemen. And still, America has this aversion to having a standing army. That's always a big deal in the founding of the country because they, they looked at standing army as being a danger uh, to democracy, to republic. Uh, you will note that Washington resigned his commission as a general because he did not think it a good idea for a general with an army behind him to take the presidency because the the uh, danger or the temptation maybe uh, is too great for him to take over the country and become a dictator. And so he set a precedent that for every general after that, who, when he became president, would resign his commission, step out of the army and be a civilian leader of the country, even though he is the commander in chief. So quite an unusual situation when you look back at most of history. Uh, so he, he's using volunteer army, militia basically, uh, Jackson did to win the Battle of New Orleans. We, uh, the British don't, of course, for apparent reasons, like to think of the War of 1812 because they lost yet again. And uh, so that's not on their radar. The Canadians think a little differently. They, they look at the War of 1812 as being their War of Independence. And so things with them changed after the war. They became more of a commonwealth of Great Britain uh, and not a vassal state or an American colony. And uh, interestingly enough, from that war as well, our border with Canada was established, and uh, it pretty well has remained the same ever since. The other idea that is gaining a great deal of credibility in 1809 is going to continue under James Madison, who will be the president during the War of 1812, is the idea of manifest destiny. And that is that we are going to take this continent, that it is God ordained, that God has somehow placed us here and we will eradicate the enemy. And you're going to see this playing into our treatment of Native Americans from this point forward, all the way through 1889, which is the Battle of Wounded Knee, when the final battles with Native Americans and the Indian Wars will cease. But we pretty well are set on eradicating them. There is a point at which uh, it's about genocide, wiping them out, taking them. A lot of that goes back to the American exceptionalism idea, which started much earlier. 
And uh, I contend that it started even on the deck of the ship in Plymouth, England, when the Puritans were coming to build Boston. And there was a three-hour sermon by Cot uh, uh, James Cotton, who it was called, uh, you know, you are the new Israel. This is the new promised land. God will go before you and eradicate your enemies. You go in and take the land. And when they got here, they began to find the uh, carcasses of, of fallen Native Americans who were dying from disease. And in their mind, they saw that as God defeating their enemies. And much like Israel did in the land of the promised land in the Old Testament, they go in and wipe them out and uh, take the land. And so that becomes American exceptionalism, that somehow we are special, uh, that God's given us this land, that it is the promised land, that we are going to be a Christian nation. All those things you still hear uh, echo today in the, the extreme right conservative wing of politics and, and different things. So 1809, we are, we're being pushed around, bullied by the uh, British. And so by the War of 1812, uh, we've had enough and we declare war. It's called Mr. Madison's War because he was the major proponent of that war. And so moving forward with that battle in New Orleans, uh, Andrew Jackson is going to be much on the national radar. He is a kind of loose, a loose cannon in some sense. He's an Indian fighter. Uh, he runs for election in 1830 uh, or 24, and uh, he loses to John Quincy Adams. Uh, he is angered by that. And of course, the war, the, the war of 1812 will pretty much be the end of the Federalist Party. Uh, and so Jackson and Martin Van Buren form a new party of the Democratic Party. And so uh, Jackson will run in 1828 and he will win. And of course, uh, they will change things. Uh, the Constitution originally only allowed white men of some property to vote in the elections, and Jackson will change that to all white men, regardless of whether you have property or not. So that becomes kind of the democratic idea of, uh, you know, every, every white man was free and could and had the right to vote. Of course, Native Americans couldn't vote, Black people couldn't vote all those things, but it kind of explains that to you. Among Jackson's mo more notorious uh, actions was removal of the Cherokee, 1828, and the five civilized tribes. They were all Cherokee, Choctaw, uh, you know, all, of, all the different five tribes that had made every effort to civilize and assimilate into the American society. The Cherokee had finally given up all their lands except to Chota, Georgia, and then they find, they discover gold in Dahlonega. And so the, the Georgians were not going to have the Native Americans sitting on land that had gold. So they pushed the issue. John Ross, the, pre, the, the uh, principal chief of the Cherokee, took the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and won. And, uh, the, and, and, and earned the right for the Cherokee to remain on their land. And Jackson says, well, let Mr. Marshall uh, uh, enforce his, his opinion if he wants to. And he went ahead and sent the army in and removed the, uh, the natives all west of the, uh, of the Mississippi. Over 3,000 people died on that journey. And so it became one of the black marks in history. And uh, for that reason, Jackson is not uh, very well thought of among many, of, uh, many academics or others for that reason. But at any rate, 1832 would have been the end of his presidency, but he did have protégés who followed him. James K. Polk, for instance, will become president uh, during the Mexican-American War, will in actually add more land to the continent, continental United States, almost as much as the Louisiana Purchase under Thomas Jefferson. And of course, uh, I personally think the Mexican-American War was, was just a land grab to take Texas, and uh, we did get Texas, California, all that land, so quite a bit of land. So this period is very important. Again, that's Manifest Destiny. Uh, how much of it are we going to take? And uh, Manifest Destiny, they give warning to European powers that we will not take uh, lightly any encroachment upon uh, our, our on the North American continent by any Europeans, that the land is ours, and we will take it and uh, do with it as we will. And that's pretty much Manifest Destiny. Finally, in 1890, the American Census Bureau will announce that the West is closed. <coughs> and so uh, 
that ends the, uh, the settlement movement. Uh, until next week, thanks so much. <laughs>